Here are five modern controversial cars I actually think are pretty cool. The first one is actually the new Countach. So with the old Countach, for its time it was rather an extreme design car, especially for the latter half of its existence. For the earlier half it basically just looked like a souped up Mira, but towards the end of its generation it was one of the most extreme looking cars that existed on the road back then, which is rather in character for Lamborghini's design language. As for the reimagining of the Countach, it's rather muted for what we expect from modern Lamborghini, and I'm just gonna say it, I prefer it that way. It's not obscenely boring to the point that it's just not a Lamborghini anymore, it still has just enough excitement to it. In my opinion, this is what I would actually think is the perfect reimagining of a Countach, in fact, it's the perfect mix of modern and classic, and I really just don't understand what the hate for this car is, people just keep saying it's too boring, it needs more vents, it needs blah yada yada, edges, sharpness, spoilers, and wings, and a good standard to measure supercars off of. It reminds me a lot of what Maserati is doing with the MC20 and very to the point design where everything that is on there like when it does have vents it serves a purpose it's not overkill and that's not to say cars like the Venador SVJ has overkill in the sense that its vents don't serve a purpose as all the things on that car it's more function over form but in my opinion look, look what I'm really just trying to get at is I, I really don't like try hard edgelord cars that's pretty well known fact of me personally is a lot of modern cars these days have an overly try hard an edgy appearance and it's just nice to see Lamborghini have more of the smooth subtle look the next car is the 2022 Civic. I'm not going to spend much time on this car since I talk about it a lot on this channel, but for the same reason I like the new Countach, I also like the, the new Civic. So the new generation of Civic, a lot of people say it's too boring and blah 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 blah. I think it's perfectly fine. One of the biggest complaints of the previous generation is that it had too many fake vents, so we got what we asked for. All you guys criticized it for having fake vents. Did you really think Honda was going to keep those vents and just make them functional the next generation? Do you really think they were able to afford to do that. In my opinion, it was rather likely they couldn't, so it was just easier for them to just smooth out the bodywork there and just get rid of the fake vents. Now, I do have one major complaint with it, is I do think it's a bit too big, and I am going to miss the coupe. I fully understand those criticisms, and hopefully they get addressed as the car moves along through its generation. Maybe they might release a coupe later. That's a joke. They're probably not. But maybe they might make the car actually have vents and have a more aggressive design when they bring around its Type R model. And that I can see Honda doing because that's something that a lot of other cars do is they keep the base model simple looking and then for the actual upscale model they start giving it actual functional vents and so on and so forth. It also makes the higher trims feel more special since they look different. Staying on the topic of Honda or Acura, this is going to shock a lot of people and even shocks myself. I actually really like the new Acura NSX Type S, mostly due to the current state of the automotive market, especially the JDM market. If you haven't watched my videos talking about prices from five years ago versus now, and not just talking, I actually mathematically use factual evidence from back then just to show how stupidly things have inflated. So back then, buying a Nissan GT or buying a McLaren 570S or Lamborghini Huracan or anything made more sense than a brand new NSX because the brand new second generation NSX retailed at an MSRP of $205,000. However, five years later, Acura has struggled to move these cars off their lot. So they started selling brand new ones for around 160 grand MSRP, then 150, and now 138 grand MSRP. Then you could even find used ones for like 109 grand and so on and so forth. They're actually cheaper than the first generation NSX. SX, and they're much cheaper than, well, GTRs of the same year have started to inflate, so they're actually cheaper than those even, which completely leveled the playing field and my whole perception and main problem with this car. A car that was 205 grand for the base model at initial release, you're not going to believe what I'm about to say is the initial release price of the Type S. 169 grand. That to me is a very down-to-earth number. Acura right now is swinging, and they had a few misses, but this is absolutely a hit. Whoever made this price is very self-aware of the market right now and is very humble in understanding of what they need to price the car as. Sure, the first few models are going to sell over markup, they always do, but if you wait a few years and once this whole chip shortage starts to slow down and we catch up with production, the Acura NSX Type S is a really good buy for the price of 170 grand. It's going to be a lot faster and a lot better and more sporty than the base model is, but around 35 grand less retail for what the base model did when it was first released, which means this is kind of Acura not outright apologizing, but an acknowledgement
acknowledgement of how stupid and ridiculous the original price of the NSX was. So they didn't pull that with the Type S. I was really scared they were gonna release the Type S and price it at like 240 grand. A lot of people were, but 170 grand is really nice. The next controversial car that I think is still really cool and I respect a lot is the Hennessy Venom F5. If you've heard of Hennessy, you obviously know of their Hennessy Venom GT and what it performed back in 2013. It ended up breaking a world record. It was a very fast car, but a lot of people criticized it for being, oh, it's just a kit car Lotus with a Corvette engine. They're not entirely wrong because it was a joint development between Lotus and Hennessy, so it was Britain and America that helped make it. But to be fair, the Bugatti is funded by like 16 different companies, so in my opinion, that's not something you really hold against original Hennessy. What really haunts Hennessy is his original reputation of what he did when he tuned Vipers back in the 90s. And a lot of it I do, I wouldn't say forgive, but I can see how it happened. He was a company that got popularized way too quickly through magazines and got way more clientele attraction than he was actually able to handle with the current assets he had available to him, which meant it where he had a slow turnaround time, which then caused it where people became impatient. But this was something that happened so long ago and something that he Himself has even been on many automotive podcasts as well as been on the automotive world and been interviewed by many people and he's talked about his past he's addressed it he acknowledges it and I can tell for the most part he's learned and grown from it it's been a long 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 time and his company has been faring a lot better thankfully for it but personally in my opinion he's no longer the most infamous hypercar creator for America seeing as SSC did their whole stunt with the two guitar a few years ago where they just outright lied about its top speed and it Modern day Hennessy has proven himself to be rather truthful and certainly more truthful than SSC as he's rather hesitant about sharing news about his F5, which makes people only doubt him more, but in my opinion, he's just trying to hone his craft. He's probably learned his lesson of, look, it's better to make something really, really good and have it come late than to just rush it and make it suck because he quite literally has learned that from personal experience at this point. On to the honorable mentions before we get to the final entry in this video. One of the honorable mentions is not rather that modern, but I'm just gonna throw it out here because it's a really underrated that childhood me loved to death, and that's the Venturi Atlantique 400 GT. The Atlantique was a, well, it was called an F40 clone, and if you look at it long enough, you can kind of see it. Childhood me actually saw this car before he saw the F40 because I played Gran Turismo 2, so I thought the F40 was a clone of this car. So it goes to show how what you grow up around can determine what you revere. And I still think it looks sick as heck, and personally, I actually think this might rouse some people up. I think it looks cooler than the F40. It's just got this weird charm to it. They're also a heck a lot cheaper than the F40 and in the color blue they really pop. I love the way the front fascia looks. I love the way the rear looks. Even this weird bump up here underneath their spoiler. I don't know why it's like that but it looks cool to me. I was just exposed to this car a lot growing up as a kid so I have a higher admiration for it. Of course it's not the greatest powertrain in the world. It does use a PRV engine which stands for Peugeot Renault Volvo engine and it's not the worst engine in the world but it's certainly not what you expect of when you see a car that looks this sick and had the racing pedigree that it had. It wasn't a world-class championship of by any means, but it certainly wasn't a loser of a car either, like an unfortunate other car that I admired in Gran Turismo, like the Vector, which, while looking great and being one of my favorite childhood cars, adult me would grow up and learn that the Vector M12 was rather not that good, and was born out of a very terrible marriage between several companies. My second honorable mention is any remots. So most car guys seem to hold the level of hostility towards electric cars. I personally quite literally rely on the sound of a vehicle to even maintain my sanity. It's something that's very therapeutic for me and I wish that was a joke, but anyone who's watched this video that I'm gonna link here that's now enlisted because YouTube marked it as sensitive content. Yeah, it's, I'm not joking. It's, they're literally like medication for me. Anyways, the point is sound for vehicles matters a lot, which is my biggest gripe with electric cars. My second biggest gripe is, well, they're really hit like it just seems like every electric car manufacturer just for some reason agreed that cars need to look as simple as possible because simple is future. Ooh, look how simplistic it is. Wow, it lacks vents and grills. It's so simple. Quirky and you know, it just looks like you lack any intelligent design or lack any thought to just actually hire a designer. And it shows a lack of skill to me and just looks lazy. Like simplicity is not the future. This reminds me of company logos. I'm going to put up on screen right now. Everyone knows this meme where like company logos over time get simpler and simpler and simpler because that's the future. Well, if that's the future, I'd like to go back a bit. Let's talk about the positive and why I mentioned remots to begin with. Because electric cars and my rant over them, is a t that's a rant for another time. I'm trying to stay positive this video. Remots actually look very beautiful and they don't look woefully boring and they don't put me to sleep when I hear them or see people drive them because they actually have excitement. They have noise. Some of them even have multiple gears so you still shift in them. And yeah, you could argue that's, oh, 
well, they're defeating the whole purpose of being an electric car. I don't care. That's exactly the type of electric car I'd see myself wanting to own in the future. And to see that one man in this world is still crazy enough to want to preserve that type of excitement, I salute him. And I hope more people rally behind that and more manufacturers, once the inevitable age of electric falls upon us, follow in his footsteps and see what he accomplishes and think to themselves, hey, cars should still be fun. They should still be exciting. They don't have to be boring. The final controversial car that I think is cool is the BMW M8. So all kinds of BMWs have the same shape. I'll be honest with you, M3s, M4s, and 5 Series, they all have this taller roof line. They have like a squared body and they have these sweeping hoods and so on and so forth. Now, what always stood out to me was the 6 Series. So the M6 was always considered my personal favorite BMW to ever exist. Of course, I like the older 8 Series, but we haven't heard from them for a long time. So I just had to like the 6 Series instead. When I look at the M6 from the 2006 era of the V10, to the M6 that had the twin turbo V8, it strikes me as one of the most beautiful cars that BMW ever made, and most people think the opposite. A lot of people think those two cars are the ugliest modern cars BMW has ever made, and that goes to show how different my tastes and expectations are from normal BMW fans. Personally, I like how ridiculously non-BMW those BMWs look. They have a very short roof line, they have more of a curvy look, their hood is not as sweeping, it's more muscular, and then finally they have a a nice wide stance to them. They have a very traditionally just aggressive design as opposed to luxurious design. The re-release of the M8 took everything that I loved about the M6 platform and just amplified it. They made it wider, lower, menacing, and they made it even more muscular. This to me is a very imposing car. It's one that makes a statement and it's also one that is also drives with a statement as well. It's an insanely fast car, very well priced car. You can find these for around the six figure range and in that range again with the stupid and inflation that's going on. Surprisingly, in that price range, they're actually dominating most other cars you could buy that. But the M8 is a hard, hard fought warrior. It's something that gives me a lot of thought and something I might actually buy a few years in the future when they go even cheaper as the used market advances even further. This to me is not a pompous luxury car. It's a very recognizable design. It's going to be a standout, something that people will look back and actually admire later on in the same way that people admired the V10 M6 after its death. They're like, oh, that car we called an ugly, sad dog when it first came out because it had really weird looking puppy eyes. And people said that about the M5 sedan too, and now everyone wants that car. Anyways, that brings us to the end of this video. If you enjoy cars and automotive content, make sure to subscribe and make sure to like this video to boost it in the algorithm. Other than that, thank you for watching and see y'all next time. Blade Angel out.